Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. When you find that, put a marker in it. And then Numbers chapter 7. And when you find that, put a marker in it. And Romans chapter 7. I'm going to read a, a, a lot of scripture this morning because, frankly, God's words are far more influencing than mine are. Um, I have a message that I believe God has laid on my heart for today's generation. The Bible talks about for such a time as this. And I, I can't think of a time in the history of my lifetime when people have been more burdened down than they are now. We have burdens coming at us from every side. We have governmental burdens. We have financial burdens. We have marital burdens. We have uh, health burdens. We, we've, got, we've got burdens just jumping at us from every, every side. And sometimes they can become, become very overwhelming. I'm not sure what to title the message this morning. One of the points in the message this morning is not everybody gets a wagon. I taught on not everybody gets a, wed, a, a, a wagon. Not everybody gets a wedding either, so sorry guys. Uh, but not everybody gets a wagon. I, I taught on that at my mom's funeral because of the issues and stuff she had lived with for the most of her life. This morning in Galatians chapter 6, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden." Now it seems like here we have a contradiction of Scripture. Back in verse number 2 it says for us to bear his burdens. And then in verse number 5 it says you've got to bear your own burdens. And so what I believe is taking place here is there's two separate kinds of burdens that we're going to bear. Some of the burdens, and I thank God for this church. I love this church and I love this place and I love this people because we can come in here and we can pour our hearts out to each other and we can share with each other and we can know that we can go home and we can have people praying for us. We know that when we pour our hearts out to each other we can cry, we can laugh, we can rejoice, we can we can be discouraged and we can pour our hearts out one to another and we can be confident that people aren't going to laugh at us or make fun of us or ridicule us or whatever because we've poured our hearts out to God's people in God's house and we've come together for a common purpose and I'm glad that this is that kind of place that we can bear each other's burdens. We can share each other's burdens. We've all had family troubles that we've shared. We've all had financial troubles that we've shared. We've all had health troubles that we've shared. And we bear each other's burdens. And we can know there's probably not a church on the face of this planet that if you ask for prayer that will get prayed for any more than this church will pray for you. If somebody requests a prayer this morning, I'll guarantee you before the day's over, it's been prayed for on numbers of occasions. And so I praise God for that. But I also believe that down in verse number 5, for every man shall bear his own burden. There's some things that you have in your heart and your past and in your life that you can't share with anybody else. There's two reasons. Number one, it's too painful. And number two, it's not about it, nobody else's business. You know, if we've done somebody wrong, then our responsibility is to go to that person and make it right. But there's some burdens that we carry that we don't publicize, that we don't share all of our dirty laundry out there. We don't tell everybody what's going on in our private lives or in our past lives. It's nothing that nobody needs to know. It's buried under the cross and buried under the blood of Jesus, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. But I believe that there's two separate kinds of burdens, those that we can share and those that we have to bear. And and I've got plenty of my past and stuff that I have to bear. We were talking about in the latter part of Sunday school this morning about how God lets us go just so far and no more. We've all strayed from God. We've all gotten away from God. The Bible tells us all we like sheep have gone astray and each one into our own way. And, and and God has had us on that check chain and He'll let us go just so far and then He'll snatch us back. If you're truly a child of God, He'll only let you go just so far before He snatches you back. I have full confidence that one of these days God's going to reel in the leash on Ray Dale and some of the others that have once professed Jesus Christ as their Savior, once lived for Jesus Christ as their Savior. I have a good friend of mine, Roy Thomas, 
who I believe God called him to preach years and years ago. And he said, no, I ain't going to preach. Turned into the, turned to the bottle. Turned into an alcoholic. I have several friends of mine who, who told God no about how things. And God let them go just so far and have their own way for so far. And then when it came 15 times, Jesus just hooked him up and reeled him back in. And I think that's the same way with every one of us. And so there's some points in our lives we have burdens that we have to bear ourselves. We know how to share those burdens. This church is great at sharing burdens. This, this church is, is, is wonderful. The Sunday school time downstairs is a burden-sharing place. We get together. I mean, for 30 minutes this morning, we've shared our hearts this morning. We've shared our praises. We've shared our prayer requests. We've shared our heartaches and our heartbreaks and our, and our heart joys. And that's what God's church is supposed to be. That's what God's people. He says, bear each other's burdens. He says, lift each other up in prayer. Carry each other. If one falls down, the other one pick him up. All kinds of things that the Scripture teaches us to bear each other's burdens. But then he says we've got some stuff that we have to bear ourselves. It's easy for us to bear each other's burdens. It's easy for us to share with one another on our burdens. But what about those we carry ourselves? What about those things that we can't tell anybody else? I heard about a preacher who was preaching one night. And a young man came up to him. He sat down on the front row and he just cried and rejoiced and praised and all through the services and after the preaching service was over. He came up to the preacher and he says, Preacher, that was a really great message. I've been listening to you for years and years and years and I really enjoy your preaching and I enjoy your messages. And and he said, but I've got got one favor I need to ask for you. He said, tonight, he said, will you pray very, very hard for me? He said, I've got something I've got to do before morning and, and, and I need your prayers. And the preacher said he had another meeting the next day and so he, he drove all night to get to the meeting and he said, early the next morning he was still on the road and his cell phone rang. And he said, uh, we just found Jay out in the field behind his house. He'd blown his head off. And Jay was the man who just told him the night before how much he knew. See, there's burdens you carry that nobody else knows about. We have teenagers that are sitting in our community this morning that will be home tonight and they'll be slicing. They'll be cutting. We have our, our, our local people out here on the streets who are trying to drown out their sorrows, trying to forget, trying to disappear. Drug addicts, uh, prostitutes, alcoholics trying to drown out the past, trying to bury those things they just have a hard time burying. Christians sitting in churches this morning, not serving God, not doing things for God, because we're so ashamed of our past. Because we're so ashamed of what we used to be. Every time you sit there and you start getting super spiritual and God's beginning to fill you with His Holy Ghost and you're about to get excited loose and rave a hand or, or even maybe even God forbid say hallelujah or, or, or praise the Lord in church or actually get a hand up in the air and then the devil reminds you of who you used to be. You got no right to be here. You got no right to be thanking God. You got no reason. No, uh-uh, you're not worthy. Well, the truth be known, we don't serve Him because we're worthy. We serve Him because He's worthy. Right. How do we handle those burdens that we have to bear? Some of the burdens that we have to bear... Or maybe failures? Our past failures. How many of you like me, you know you failed God? God's told you something to do and you didn't do it? Or God called you and you said, I ain't answering right now? You ever got a phone call and you just watch the phone ring? Or you check the caller ID? I have a whole family of daughters and wives who, oh, it's daddy calling. I've, I've actually watched Rose, and, and she doesn't have internet, so I don't have to worry about hurting her mom's feelings. But I've actually watched Rose look at the phone, and it's her mom, and she'll lay it down. I don't, I don't want to talk to her right now. I've picked up my phone and saw your number on it sometime. <laughs> but what, how do we handle our past failures? I, I, I can be praying. And I can be getting close to God. And I can be communicating with God. And all of a sudden, something out of my passion runs through my prayer mind. I can be be just going, going, I can be sitting in church listening to the Word of God or preaching the Word of God. And all of a sudden, my past comes like Richard Petty coming across the finish line. Just bumping through my mind. And Satan says, see, you ain't nothing. You don't even deserve to be here. And Satan will jump on them opportunities like a chicken on a June bug. It's it's amazing how how Satan remembers all of our past. 
Every single screw up I've ever made, Satan has them jotted down, highlighted, and notations out beside it. Remind him, remind him, remind him, remind him. My God says, it's buried in the depths of the deepest sea, and there's sins I choose to remember no more. But Satan says, I'm going to remind you. So how do we get rid of those past failures? We take it to the cross. God says, I remember their sins no more. God says, the blood covers all. God doesn't see me. God sees the blood of His precious baby boy. God doesn't see what I was. God doesn't see the raging bull. God doesn't see who I used to be. God doesn't see what I was. God doesn't see the lecherous, lustful, sinful pervert that I was sitting in God's house. God doesn't see what I used to be. The only thing my God sees is me coming to the foot of the cross, laying myself at Jesus' feet and saying, have mercy on me. I'm nothing but a worthless, good-for-nothing sinner. That's what my God sees. Your past is the past. Let it stay there. We're the only ones that keep digging it up. Jesus never has ever reminded you of a past sin. Jesus has never interrupted your prayer life and said, but you remember when? Jesus has never interrupted you sitting in a service. You don't need to be here. Satan will, but not Jesus. So how do we handle that burden of our past? I wake up nights in a cold sweat remembering my past. Sometimes I even, God forbid, I question whether I'm even a Christian or not. How could you do something? Because I know before I was saved, I was a wicked, wretchful, sinful, lustful pervert, and God forgive me and redeem me of all. But I've screwed up since I've been saved. I know none of you guys have, but I did. And not once has God ever reminded me of a confessed sin. Only the Holy Spirit will let me know if I haven't confessed it. I can be praying, and Lord, if there's anything between me and you. And he says, hang on. (laughs) You know, he's got the books. And he's got the books of confessed, and he's got the books of non-confessed. Actually, that's not accurate scripturally at all. All of my sins were paid for on the cross of Calvary, but it makes a good illustration. But the Holy Spirit will guide you and teach you and lead you and direct you. And if you ask God to show him what's screwing up in your life, he'll show you. That's why I don't ask. (laughs) But our past failures, how do we handle the past failures? Take them to the cross. Take your burdens to the cross and leave them there. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. I told some of the young ladies over here this morning, yeah, they're lifted, but we take them back home with us again. You know, we need to deposit them. We need to just lay them down at the cross and leave them there. Our past failures are exactly that. Our past failures. Next thing we do, this is this is the fatigue. Because I mean, no, I know you guys are real spiritual, super spiritual, godly Christians, and you're just waiting for a real pastor. And I pray one day he'll get you one. But in the meantime, there's going to be some burdens that you have to bear. They're your own, and you got to bear them. And sometimes it's not because you're a sinful, lustful, perverted sinner. Sometimes it's because you're a God-fearing, God-loving, God-honoring, God-serving servant of the living God. Turn to Numbers chapter 7. Numbers chapter 7. Ethan, would you go grab me a paper towel, please? Numbers chapter 7. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Old Testament and the different priestly order and things like that, but but I I love the Old Testament and I love the typology of the Old Testament. I love the lessons that are taught in the Old Testament. I'm just going to touch on one this morning. Look at Numbers chapter 7 and pick up in verse number 4. There are several other places that you can find the the history of these people and the, the design and the layouts of these people. Thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate that. Blow my nose on camera. Chapter 7, verse number 4, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, <clears throat> Take it of them that they may do service of the tabernacle and of the congregation, and thou shalt give them unto the Levites, to every man according to his service. 
Now, at this time, the, the, the authorities, the ruling authorities had given wagons and oxen and all kinds of stuff to help with the, the disbursement and living and, and all that kind of stuff. And the Levites, the priestly order of the Levites, were in charge of the temple and the temple worship and things like that. They were in charge of transporting the temple and they were in charge of erecting the tabernacle. And, 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 and you know, in the Old Testament, they moved it from one place to another. It was made out of badger skins and, and the rods and the silver and the brass and the gold and the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and the candlestick and the laver and the, the table of showbread. And all of that stuff had to be packed up and transported transported, every time God said, let's go, they had to pack all of that stuff up and they had to move it to the next location. And, and it was, I mean, you remember the, the size of the temple veil? I mean, just the veil itself was pulled with 30 yoke of oxen and all of that kind of stuff and all of the br- brass rods and all of the golden and silver inlays and all of the sockets that it all fit in. And all of that stuff had to be taken up, loaded up on carts except for the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, except for the Ark of the Covenant, had to be loaded up on carts and stuff. And they had to transport it from one place to another. Now look, and Moses took the wagons and the oxen and he gave them to the Levites. So he gave them to the preachers. Two wagons and four oxen he gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. Four wagons and eight oxen he gave to the sons of Moriah according to their service under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none. Because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that that they should bear upon their shoulders. So you've got these different priestly families who were given specific wagons and specific yokes of oxen and they were given a job. Okay, you get all the curtains, you get all the badger skins, you get all of the tent poles, you get the uh, the candlestick, you get the labor, you get the table of showbread, you get this stuff, you load it up on your wagons and and you get ready to transport. And so you got these Levites of these different sons and these different sons and they get the job done. They're tearing down all of this stuff and they're getting it all loaded up on their wagons and when they get it all loaded up on their wagons okay let's roll and they sit back and they grab their glass of iced tea or their diet Mountain Dew and they're ready to get on the journey and they're ready to go to the next place that God has for them to erect the tabernacle and to set up a worship time with Him but the sons of Kohath got no wagons they got no oxen they had to bear their burden upon their own shoulders not everybody gets a wagon the sons of Kohath were just as righteous they were just as holy they were just as priestly they were just as like any of the other sons of, of the sons of the Levi. They were just like anybody, but they had a burden that they had to bear themselves on their own shoulders. While everybody else could load their stuff up on the wagon and let it roll down the road to the next location for 50 miles across the hot burning sand, blowing heating desert, pulling the skin off their bodies, they had to walk with their burden upon their own shoulders. And they had to transport it. From one worship place to another. So what do you do with the burden of fatigue? Everybody else is sitting back sucking on their dying Mountain Dew and the sons of Korath are going across that hot desert poor and bearing their own burden. Everybody else was just chilling for the ride. But the sons of Korath had to bear their own burden. And you can't tell me they didn't get tired along the journey. When Satan attacks you the worst is when you get tired. On those days, Rose was talking about she'd been transported up by Scotty this morning or whoever, you know, I'm not sure who was at the house after I left. Maybe I should stay there a little bit longer, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, sometimes there's times when you and I don't feel like being in church. We've worked hard all day. The pressures of life have just about to beat us over. We're burdened from every side. The burden from this one and the burden from that one. I was talking to a young lady last week and she was talking about how burdened down she was. I said, all you need to do is just put Reverend in front of your name. I said, I understand. Bearing everybody's burdens, bearing everybody's trouble, being everybody's sounding board. I know exactly what you're talking about. And sometimes you just get tired. Sometimes you don't feel like being in church. Some of you got up this morning and you had to make a decision whether you were actually going to come to church or not. What do you do with your fatigue? You take it to church. You take it to church. The sons of Kohath, remember the journey. Everybody else has their stuff loaded up on the wagon. They're going across the desert to the next location. When they get to the next location, the tabernacle is being built. The tabernacle is being erected. And the only time the sons of Kohath get to lay their burden down is when the church is built. When the church was there, they got to lay their burden down. Lay your burdens down at church. You may have had a terrible day. You may have had a day that sucks on all other days you've had that week. Take it to church. 
How many times have I ever come to church passing a kidney stone or having a fever or having a rough day or having something that's gone terribly wrong and not want to be here and come to church and God's Spirit just says, Whoop! and you get a win from another world and God just blows through your heart. And some of you, I know you're sitting here staring at me like a calf from the new gate and you don't have a clue what that wind is. And you know about God, but you don't know who God is. Somebody, we were talking in Sunday school this morning, talking about, we were talking about individuals who know about God or know God or believe in God or believe there is a God. I said, so does the devil. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people who believe there's a God, but they don't believe in God. The devil, the Bible says, the devils believe in God and they tremble. So what do you do when you get tired, when you don't feel like it the most? That's when you need the church the worst. We got people laying out this morning because I didn't feel like it this morning. I wonder if Jesus felt like going to the cross. I wonder if any of the disciples felt like being stoned or crucified or burned at stake. I wonder if the, the three Hebrew children felt like getting thrown in the fiery furnace or Daniel into the lion's den or, or Noah building the ark for 120 stinking years. He had to hammer wooden pegs into big old beams and got nobody but three aggravating boys and their wives to help him with it. I wonder if Joshua felt like walking around the city of Jericho every single day with people all up along the walls calling them a bunch of idiots, looking at them and laughing at them all day every day. I don't care whether you feel like it or not. Jesus didn't feel like it when He went to the cross. God didn't feel like it when He gave His baby boy to the earth to raise for 33 and a half years and watch Him treated and mistreated and nailed to an angry cross buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus didn't feel like it either. Since when does our feeling depend upon our salvation? Fatigue. Take it to the church. Not everybody gets a wagon. There's some burdens you're going to have to bear. There's some things you're going to have to tote for a lifetime. Some of you got unsaved husbands. Some of you got unsaved wives, children. Some of you are going to have to bear those burdens. Not everybody gets a wagon. Some of you are destined to be struggling financially day to day. Some of you are struggling. Wayland's sitting here this morning. He's in tremendous pain this morning where the folks run into him the other day. And his leg is just killing him. He's got neck problems. He's got cancer. He's got all kinds of issues. Not everybody gets a wagon. Don't mean you're less than a Christian. Don't mean God ain't blessing you. It may just mean that you, you. In another part of the scripture, it talks about the Koath. The Koath. It says they were entrusted with the most precious things. Sometimes the burdens you've got is because God trusts you more than He does everybody else. Sometimes the reason you got your kids is because God didn't want to give them to nobody else. Now, sometimes like me, that was a punishment. But <laughs> nah, I got wonderful kids. But fatigue. What do you do? Ain't that the truth? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do with your past failures? You take them to the cross. What do you do when you're tired? What do you do with your fatigue? You take it to church. So, I don't know. Sunday morning? 9.30? Sunday's going at 9.30? You're kidding? 9.30? That's the only day I get to sleep late. Will you get up at 4 o'clock to go deer hunting? You get up for the midnight madness after Thanksgiving and stay up on the sidewalk all flipping night. You sit at a ball game in the cold and rain and shiver and watch your team lose for four hours. <laughs> How long did the track meet go on yesterday? Is that what they were doing? State championships? Track? Cross country? What, they run for like miles and miles and miles? Yeah, it takes them a while to get there. The wind was blowing like crazy where I was yesterday. I bet folks stood out there in that wind all day long yesterday. And they can't even see the runners, not unless they're running beside them. And then they'd have been in the race. But I bet you they were out there. Some of you are going to go home this afternoon, you're going to sit for three or four hours and watch a football game. But about, about two more minutes, and y'all gonna start looking at your watches. <laughs> yeah. Fatigue, and I'm only on point two. <laughs> How do you handle your failures? Take them to the cross. How do you handle fatigue? Take it to Jesus. Take it to the church. Take it to the church. Now, now, now the one that I battle with a lot. 
Go to Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do allow not, for which I would that I do not, but what I hate, that's what I do. The things I don't want to do, I end up doing them anyway. So not only do we battle our past failures, not only do we battle our fatigue, but we also battle our flesh. Paul said, I, I, things I want to do, I don't want to do them. Things I don't want to do, I end up doing them anyway. So how do we handle our flesh? Paul said we crucify our flesh daily. Now, Ethan, come up here a minute, Pete. You know what crucifixion is, right? You nail, you get nailed to the cross. You want to stretch out like you're hanging on a cross? Mm-hmm. The Bible says crucify yourself daily. You want to give me an illustration of how you can crucify yourself? I mean, you can, you can, you, Jesus had His feet nailed to the cross, right? Can you, can you, can you nail your feet to the cross? I mean, can you, can you reach down and drive a hammer? You can't do that? Maybe I need a volunteer. You can't take that hand and reach down there and, and drive a nail through your feet? You ain't got your hands nailed yet. Not yet. You still you still able to nail your feet. Okay, go ahead and nail your feet to the floor. All right, you got them nailed. All right, put your other arm up there. Now you can nail that one, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Only one wax, all you took. Ain't <laughs> real strong. All right, now now nail the other hand to the cross. You can't do that, can you? You can't crucify yourself. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit living within you. As a born again Christian, the Bible says He comes in and dwells. The Holy Spirit of God is the only one that can help you crucify your flesh. Because you can't do anything. You can't do it in your own strength. You cannot crucify yourself. You can nail parts of you, but you can't finish the job. You can do so much on your own. You can lay down so much on your own. You can quit or start so much on your own. But you can't completely crucify yourself outside of the Holy Ghost of God. You see, that's what I have a hard time. I know what I was. And I know what God is delivering me from. I battle my flesh every day. The, 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 the past that I come from is not a spiritual past. I don't have the advantage of being godly homes and godly church and a godly childhood. Every one of my family for generations, except my parents when they got saved, were alcoholics. The, 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 the perversion that ran through my family for generations. The sexual history of my family, my culture, my, my, my upbringing. It's a battle every day. I know some of you sitting here staring at me like you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but it's real. It's real. When things are normal in your life, you don't know they're wrong until something changes you. And the Holy Spirit of God came into my life and began to expose all of these things that were wrong. In my life, that does not mean He drove them out. That means now I just have two natures. I have God's nature and I have the old nature. I've got God's Holy Spirit indwelling me and I can get happy as a Christian. I can take off running around this building. I can shout and praise and get excited about the things of God. I can rejoice and I can cry and I can lift up the name of Jesus for all of the great and mighty things that He's done in my life. But you give me about a half of a 30 second minute and I can go out here and I can sin with the best of them. I can look at the girls walking down the street. I can look at the porno magazines. I can get involved in all of the kind of stuff that... It, that long because I battle my flesh daily. I battle my flesh daily. 
every single day I get out of bed, it's a battle. Every single time I close my eyes and Satan whips them pictures across my mind. The time you're flipping through the TV channels, and I don't even do that anymore, are we? Because it makes sure that it's there. It's there. And all these self-righteous people sitting around praising God in their pulpits this morning, the preacher sitting here, and then they go home and get in their privacy of their own office and they punch up some keys on the internet. Don't you tell me no Bible is Right. It's so accessible now it ain't even funny. Yep. You have a choice. You can either please the flesh or you can please the spirit. But it makes me feel so good. Yeah. But there's a payday. Yeah. Getting drunk is great. Getting high is great. Getting laid is great. But there's a payday. take your failures to the cross. You take your fatigue to the church. You have to crucify your flesh. David. Paul said, things I want to do, I just don't do them. Things I don't want to do, I end up doing them anyway. And before you get all down on yourself, go back to the Old Testament. You got Abraham. Abraham was the father of the faithful. Abraham looked at his wife one day and said, God told us to go somewhere. Well, where are we going? I don't know. God said we're going to go. We're going to pack up and go. And he had the faith to leave his own country, pack up everything, and go into a land that God would show him. But just a few miles down the road, he lied about his wife being his sister because he was scared that God couldn't take care of his marriage. David, king of all kings, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands. All the young virgins and all of the land were running around him talking about how great a warrior he was laying themselves at his feet could have had any girl he wanted. And he had the strength to stand up and say, nope, keeping myself pure. But when the kings went out to war, David decided to stay home. And one bathing beauty on a rooftop caught his eye. Nothing wrong with eye catching. I told a preacher friend of mine the other day, Rose was my eye candy. Nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with, with God's creations in God. You've done a good job. But when you go, then it becomes a problem. David could have looked and said, oh, need to go back in the house. Need to go back out to war. Need to go take a cold shower. I don't care what you do, David. Just don't hang around the rooftop. Because it was something he had to live with the rest of his life. Psalm 51, it's my sin, it's my iniquity, it's my... Please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David, David lived with that cold sweat. I know that cold sweat. I know that agony that will wake you up in the middle of the night for doing something stupid. And it's a battle. It's a battle. God will give you your own way. God will let you do it. God will allow you to do it. The new man loves God, loves church, loves God's people, loves God's things, loves God, the things of God. The old man says, I don't know what the big deal is. Why you got to go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, listen to Christian music, listen to TV, listen to a sermon. Why you wait? That, that, what you, that church is way too long for me. So, I mean, it's 10 minutes after 12 and somebody's going, Good God ain't ever going to shut up. I have gone in a deer stand at 3 o'clock in the morning and sit there and become a solid frozen block of ice getting hypothermia waiting for a deer that's going to come out four hours later. The deer even got more sense than being out that time of day. But come in church. Turn on George Jones or Johnny Cash or I don't even know who new country artists are. Alan Jackson or somebody. No, ain't ain't new anymore. Oh, okay. Do they even still write country music? I don't know. 
Name him country anymore. But see, I was like Barbara Mandrell. I was country when country won't go. Cool. You know? Sit around, you know, sit around and listen to that for, for, for days on end. Turn on a Jesus love me. Oh my God. Ain't that about enough church for today? You know? Sit there and stare at a, at, a, at a TV screen for hours at a time. It's getting that season. What is it? A Hallmark Christmas movie. Oh Lord. You know, four hours of sitting there watching the same old story, different day. <laughs> Two people fall in love, ain't going to like each other. Christmas time, everything's all right. January come around, they're getting a divorce. <laughs> Sit there watching for hours at the time. Sit there. Pinterest. Facebook. YouTube. How to tie a successful knot. How to set up the perfect deer stand. See, I ain't preaching to y'all. I know me. I know me. That's why my that's why my favorite button on my on my on my computer now is 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 gospel messages. Because I know if I get sidetracked on not dying or deer stand building, I'll be there. In my flesh. In my flesh, I'm just as wicked as the people we pray for every day. In my flesh, I can be just as evil as the people that are sitting in penitentiary on death row. In my flesh, I can be just like any of the ones that we look down on every single day. In my flesh, I can be just like the young man that I helped on the way to church this morning with feces and urine all over me. Couldn't hardly see how to get down the road. In my flesh, I can be just like them. But praise an Almighty God, He delivered me from that life and He's given me the opportunity to spend my life among His people in His house worshiping Him because He's worthy. So how do I handle the burdens? That I have to bear. Take them to the cross. Take them to church. And take them to Calvary. Take them to Calvary. That's where Jesus said, It's paid for. I took care of that for you. It's all done. I've even given you a new nature. I've even given you my Holy Spirit to live inside you and show you and guide you and teach you. The blood covers it all. Where is the blood today? It's in the mercy seat. Covering my sin. Covering my sin. As the old song says, my sins not in part but the whole are nailed to the cross. And I bear them no more. That burden I don't have to bear if I take it to Calvary. Though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. We don't serve Him because we're worthy. We serve Him because He's worthy. We can never attain the height of God. We can never attain the holiness of God. But if we'll take it to the cross, take it to the church, and take it to Calvary, let it be covered by the blood of an almighty God. We can go through this life burdenless. Still have to bear them. But they don't have to be burdens. Killed a deer yesterday afternoon. Went to the house, got the cart. Came back, threw the deer up on the cart. Tied his head to the thing so it wouldn't fall off. Grabbed the two handles. Rolled it out of the woods. Roll it. Didn't even feel like there was a deer on it, did it? Just rolling along. See, it's how you handle your burdens. It's how you handle your burdens. Oh, we could have we could have drug it. Me and my crippled back broken self. I could have grabbed the ear and he could have grabbed the rest of the deer. <laughs> and knowing how crippled I am, he'd have been trying to walk out and I've been hang on, hang on, hang on. One for me and one for the deer. But instead, we were smart enough to let something else carry our burden. That's Jesus, folks. Are you smart enough to let Jesus carry your burden? I bet before the year's over, Luke will have him a cart. 
Not because he's lazy. Not because he's lazy. Not because he minds hauling the deer out of the woods. He's not going to stop shooting the deer because when you get my age, you look at how far the deer is and you look at how far away the truck is. And if the deer is closer than the truck, you don't shoot. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that law that says you can't shoot out the window. <laughs> but because he's smart, he will get a cart and he'll put a deer on it and he will roll his burden out of the woods. If you're smart this morning, you'll give your burden to Jesus. You'll take your burden to the cross. You'll take your burden to the church. You'll take your burden to Calvary. And you'll let Him. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. If you're smart. Now you can go away a dummy if you want to. And we'll just get you a big old label. One of them wrestlers, I forget who it was, he had a button on his little podium there and every once in a while he'd hit smack and he'd say, Dummy! <laughs> dummy! <laughs> dummy! <laughs> you know. I think sometimes we as Christians need that little button, don't we? Be walking along down the street, we turn our head a little bit, and dummy, <laughs> turn it back. You know, somebody pull up beside us in the truck and get a little close to the white line, and we start to give them a verbal sermon. Dummy, you know, we we go driving down the driving down the middle of the highway here. We see some of our, our locals laying on the street. And we, oh, I'm worthless, you know, dummy. <laughs> I, mean, I think we just need just a dummy button. I know where I'm gonna put mine, <laughs> right there. <laughs> I walk by. Dummy! <laughs> because in my flesh, I'm about as stupid as we come. That's why it's so very important. It's so very important to be at church. It's so very important to be at the cross. It's so very important to be at Calvary. It's so very important to be among God's people. It's so very important to say, I'm struggling in this area. Will you pray for me? Bear each other's burdens sometimes. And sometimes you've got to bear your own. How many of you would be honest enough this morning to say, i got a burden. Can't just seem to shed it. Just can't seem to shake it. Can't seem to get rid of it. Can't seem to just let it go. Will you pray for me? Because there's two ways to handle burdens. You can carry them. Or you can let Him carry them. I think about that verse that says, Take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy. And we think a yoke is this big old wooden thing that goes across your neck and it, it just puts the load on you. But you think about it. He says, Take my yoke. And a yoke generally is, is made for two. And He says, Take my yoke upon you. And it divides the, the weight. See, you can share your burden with Jesus. Or you can try to handle it on your own. Lord, we thank you this morning for your time. Thank you, God, for your message.